All right, this is video two in my ridiculously fast crash course review of AP Biology. Um, again, hoping that this is, is useful at least uh, to, to refresh your memory. Certainly you going and uh, looking stuff up on your own is, is, is the best way to do this. But um, again, sometimes just hearing the main points, you know, is, is, is helpful. Um, so you don't lose sight of the big picture when you're reviewing all the stuff that we learned all year, which was a lot. So chapter seven dealt with the cell membrane and transport in and out of cells. So when you think cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer, right? So phospholipids had the polar head and the two nonpolar tails. Uh, the tails faced each other and the polar heads faced in and out which makes sense. Um, it's a polar environment outside and inside the cell. And so polar and polar get along. Those polar heads face out and in. Uh, the nonpolar tails are scrunched together because nonpolar and nonpolar get along just fine. Um, so it's a, it's a very stable configuration, uh, phospholipid bilayer. Um, in addition to phospholipids, there's proteins of various kinds. Again, there's receptor proteins, there's channel proteins, um, geez, uh, markers that are part of the immune system to identify what cells are, are yours and which ones aren't. The, the MHC molecules, major histocompatibility complex molecules. Um, so a lot of different types of protein. In fact, the membrane is probably close to equal as far as the amount of lipid and the amount of protein. Let's say it's 45, 45. The other 10% is there are some carbohydrates. Uh, in the middle, there's cholesterol molecules. So don't forget every cell membrane has cholesterol. It's, it's not as evil as we make it out to be. It's necessary. It helps to maintain the membrane fluidity, um, helps to stabilize the membrane. So again, that's your basic structure of the cell membrane. Now, polar substances cannot cross the cell membrane without help. So they need to either be pumped across by a protein or, or go through a channel protein if they're going to diffuse across. Um, Nonpolar molecules can pass through like a ghost. And in a later chapter, when we talk about cell communication, you'll hopefully remember that story about how polar ligands need a receptor, whereas nonpolar ones, or excuse me, polar ones need a cell surface receptor, whereas nonpolar ligands can pass across the plasma membrane, and usually there's a receptor inside the cell uh, for nonpolar ligands. So that's your basic structure. Do, 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 do. Um, selectively permeable. Right, that's the buzz phrase. You think cell membrane, you think selectively permeable. Um, when molecules diffuse across, or move, I should say move across a cell membrane, they can do so passively or actively. Passive transport does not require additional energy from the cell. Molecules move down their concentration gradient, which is from high to low concentration. Um, and that's simple diffusion. Osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules, and facilitated diffusion is molecules that diffuse through a channel protein, a helper protein, sometimes called a carrier protein. But all of those I just mentioned, simple diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion are all passive transport, high to low concentration, no additional energy. Active transport's the opposite. It does require... Uh, energy in the form of ATP, typically. Um, materials go against their concentration gradient, which is from low to high concentration. So you're stockpiling molecules on one side of the membrane when you're moving them actively. Um, <laughs> I guess this is the time to bring up hypo, hyper, and isotonic. So remember when it comes to the movement of water, 
that water will always diffuse toward the hypertonic place. In other words, the area with the higher concentration of solutes, that's the hypertonic area. Um, the area with the lower concentration of solutes is called the hypotonic area. And if the ion concentration were to be the same on both sides of a membrane, we say that the, each side is isotonic to the other. So remember that when it comes to diffusion of water. Now, we also talked about water potential. So again, you might want to like just brush up on that, the, the, the size symbol, um, the solute potential plus the pressure potential equaled the water potential. And basically, it's just a mathematical way of describing which way water will diffuse from high to low water potential. The water potential is almost like the water concentration of the area, which you're never told. Right, you're always told the solute concentration. So, this idea of water potential was was created. Um, finally, as far as moving materials across the membrane, there's exocytosis and endocytosis. Again, the cell membrane can wrap around a larger molecule or substance, um, engulf it, bring it into the cell into a vacuole, um, which is known as endocytosis. There's receptor-mediated endocytosis, where instead of just pulling everything in, you can kind of selectively target which molecules are brought in. Exocytosis is the opposite, where a vesicle um, doesn't have to just be waste. It could be something useful that the cell wants to release, but the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane and releases molecules or substances, that's exocytosis, something exiting the cell. So we refer to that as bulk transport, endo and exocytosis. Now we get to chapter eight, which was another summer chapter. Um, this was kind of the all about enzymes chapter. So it does start out talking a little bit about metabolic pathways and how each step is typically catalyzed by a different enzyme. Um, Enzymes, don't forget, speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. So that hump of energy that you have to get over to start the reaction, enzymes turn a you know, 10-foot wall into a speed bump. So the reaction can start faster and more easily. That's how they speed up the reactions. Your overall change in free energy doesn't change. You're still going to go from A to B or from A to B. And remember, if... Uh, a sub, or excuse me, if a chemical reaction starts out with higher energy as reactants, lower energy as products, that's an exothermic or exergonic reaction. Lower energy to high reactants, higher energy products, energy's input, and that is an endergonic or an endothermic reaction. So enzymes are going to lower the activation energy and speed up chemical reactions. Um, so it talks about laws of thermodynamics a little bit, changes in free energy, the exo and ex, exer, exer and ex, exer and endergonic, excuse me, uh, we just talked about. ATP is brought up and how that third phosphate is the, is the really high energy bond that that third phosphate, which is negatively charged, is being brought next to two already negatively charged phosphates. So to get it attached takes a lot of energy. So that third bond stores a lot of energy. So when it's broken, it re-releases all that stored energy. Um, enzymes are very specific. They have an active site where the substrate or substrates fit into, lock and key, remember, very specific interaction. Um, enzymes are almost always proteins. RNA can act like an enzyme sometimes, remember those ribozymes, but typically we're talking about protein enzymes. Um, allosteric enzymes have a site other than the active site where either activators or inhibitors can stick into, change the shape of the active site, and either turn that enzyme on or off essentially. So definitely would look back at allosteric enzymes and how they're used uh, in negative feedback, right, to control biochemical pathways. So they're, ver they're very important in controlling uh, and, and maintaining homeostasis in, in cells. 
enzymes have very specific temperature and pH ranges that they work best at. And living things are smart, right? So we're going to, we've evolved to use enzymes in our stomach that work best at pH of two and enzymes in our small intestine that work best at pH seven. Um, Arctic fish have evolved to use enzymes that work best down around, you know, four to 10 degrees Celsius. So, um, you know, again, living things are, are quote, smart. Evolution has allowed for enzymes to be used at their ideal conditions so that they function most efficiently. All right, so chapters nine and 10, these were biggies. Um, nine was cellular respiration, 10 was photosynthesis. I hope you kept your diagrams. Uh, this is the time when they're really useful. In fact, even in college, uh, I've told you that before. So a lot to review, but again, we're light speed here. With cellular respiration, you start with glycolysis, breaking down glucose in a series of steps, each step catalyzed by a different enzyme into two pyruvate molecules. Now we're at a crossroads. If there's no oxygen, then we're going to do some type of fermentation, maybe lactic acid fermentation, like in our cells, maybe alcohol fermentation, like uh, in yeast cells. But basically, during glycolysis, you make two ATP, you make two NADHs, and the whole point of the fermentation step without oxygen is to recycle the NAD pluses to allow glycolysis to at least continue making two ATPs in the absence of oxygen. If oxygen is present, those pyruvates move into the mitochondrion and they are oxidized. Pyruvate oxidation occurs. Makes a couple NADHs, gives off a couple CO2s, and those pyruvates are changed into acetyl coenzyme A molecules in the mitochondrial matrix. Got an it, sorry. Uh, acetyl CoA's go around the Krebs cycle. We churn out some NADHs, some FADH2s, four ATPs, four CO2s. And again, this is only in the presence of oxygen does the Krebs cycle happen. Third and final part would be the electron transport chain. So in the Christe, in the folds of the inner mitochondrial membrane are cytochrome proteins that all your NADHs, your FADH2s, dump their electrons into the chain. These electrons sorry, go down the chain like a hot potato, redox, remember, reduction oxidation reactions. The energy from the hot potato, the energized electron, pumps hydrogens uh, from the matrix into the inner membrane space. They are then allowed to diffuse back into the matrix through ATP synthase. And that's where the bulk of our ATPs are made in this third and final step, the electron transport chain. This is oxidative phosphorylation. Um, chemiosmosis is the way that we're making these ATPs using ATP synthase. And at the end of the electron transport chain, there's oxygen. It's the final electron acceptor. Once it accepts those electrons, it turns into water, allows everything to keep flowing. So we make basically 36 ATPs total using oxygen, um, only two without. Photosynthesis, chapter 10, um, happens inside chloroplasts. So you'll remember that a chloroplast is inside of it are stacks of thylakoids called grana. And each thylakoid has, is surrounded by a membrane with a space in the middle. Uh, and again, these things look like Coins, you could say, again, thylakoid coin stacked up one on top of the other. Our diagram was one huge thylakoid. And so in the thylakoid membrane, there were, there were pigment molecules, there were photosystems, which were clusters of pigment molecules. So pigment molecules absorb certain wavelengths of light, reflect others. Chlorophyll A and B. Right, are the main pigments, chlorophyll A, main pigment of photosynthesis. Um, they reflect green light. The carotenoids reflect 
the reds, the oranges, the yellows. And so they reveal themselves in the fall. The screen just glitched. I hope this is okay. Um, so photons of sunlight energy hit the pigment molecules in the photosystems. Again, if you're thinking of your diagram, photosystem two comes first. Electrons get excited. Woohoo! They go down an electron transport chain. And in the case of photosystem two, that pumps H plus ions into the thylakoid space. And then they are allowed to diffuse out of the thylakoid through ATP synthase, generating ATP. Photosystem one gets hit by photons of light energy. Electrons get excited. Woohoo! Those electrons go down their own electron transport chain and they make NADPH, another high energy molecule. So this is steps one and two of the process. Remember, step one is to capture sunlight energy. As soon as the electrons, woohoo, step one is done. Step two is to convert that captured sunlight energy into chemical energy. Photosystem two makes ATP. Photosystem one makes NADPH. Step two is done. Third and final step is to use this, the, the chemical energy to power the Calvin cycle reactions out in the stroma, right, the liquid around the thylakoids. And there's a series of chemical reactions using CO2 as your carbon source, making glucose. Um, so, yeah, basically three easy steps. Capture sunlight energy, convert it to chemical energy, use the chemical energy to make glucose. Um, let's see. I think we mentioned definitely most important parts of the process. Um, don't forget, too, once that glucose is made, uh, it's going to diffuse out of the chloroplast. That's actually there's get some help to come out uh, into the cytosol where, guess what? Glycolysis is going to happen. Plant cells do photosynthesis and algae cells, but they also do cellular respiration. And so don't forget that. Plant cells have chloroplasts and mitochondria. And so the glucose gets broken down through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport. The whole story we just told happens in plant cells and algae cells too. It's just they make the glucose first because they're autotrophs. Uh, for instance, fungi and animals, uh, we're heterotrophs. We have to eat the glucose. But whether it's made or it's eaten, once it's there, the cell treats it, it treats it the same through cellular respiration. All right. So I think we'll cut it there. We went through chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. Um, coming up, we're going to talk a little bit about cell communication and cell cycle. Meiosis. Gregor Mendel and genetics is going to start. So that is what you have to look forward to in video three.